theatre during um, uh, the time of uh, foreshore and seabed uh, gave me some sage advice, which I will take to my grave, around uh, the quality of leadership that you have to maintain in hard times. Good times, people will only see the good things, but in the hard times, they see the quality of your leadership. <laughs> She has been nurtured by some of the greatest modern day leaders in Māoridom to hold one of the biggest responsibilities for her people. The Minister of Māori Development. This is her story, Nanaya Mahiga, Indigenous 100. E te māre i kura, Nanaya te ngāwe. Ka haro e ki atu ki a koe e te minita, e karangahi ane i e koe, karangahi ana koe au, hei he māre i kura ke. Nō no rere e te māre i kura te ngāwe. Thank you so much for joining us on Indigenous 100. It's great to have you with us. Hei te mea ka hanga i pua tāwa kōrero ki te tōranga pū. I hea nau ki a tuku pātai atu ki a koe pāna, ki a koe tonu ake. But I think it would be remiss of me not to start on politics. And in particular 2004. Because no matter how much we think of politics and Māori politics, Māori still think back to that time and you were right in the middle of the foreshore and seabed debate, and particularly around what happened with the hikoi. Mm. Was that one of the most traumatic political times in your life when you were faced with the situation of foreshore and seabed act, whether or not you should stay with Labour or join Tari Anatui? Talk me through that time. Well, I think uh, 2004 was eight years after I started in uh, politics and anyone who goes down that pathway uh, isn't going down uh, a road uh, where it is going to be easy and uh, let's face it you're not in politics to play tiddlywinks uh, but it would be uh, probably on reflection it would have been one of those times in my political career where it was a defining moment it uh, urged me to bring into play I guess all the political skills that I had learnt prior to Parliament, but also as a result of being in that place to ensure that I was doing the right thing for my people, but also being able to act uh, in the moment. Uh, the foreshore and seabed issue, uh, without going into depth about kind of uh, the political uh, tusslings, uh, challenged the Crown Māori uh, relationship, Crown Iwi relationship. It uh, tested some of the fundamental aspects on which our nation has been uh, based and uh, some of the uh, sharpest rub points, I guess, between uh, iwi uh, and the Crown uh, and at a very fundamental level brought into question uh, some of the aspects of Māori culture, mātauranga and tikanga uh, in relation to things that people could see here and feel, which is land, whenua, wai, uh, the moana. Uh, so for all those reasons, it wasn't an easy period of time, but I never ever saw the solution uh, outside of uh, a political, perhaps legislative one, and I always believed uh, that if I made the right decision, that decision would be based on being very transparent, uh, certainly with my uh, own people about what I was trying to do uh, with a difficult set of circumstances. There was always the opportunity to uh, go and join uh, another group who wanted to create a political party as a solution, uh, but I had to stand on my conscience and say, well, what could I achieve politically that fundamentally would protect the interests of my people who had experienced Aupatu and enable them to continue to negotiate uh, a way forward uh, given that, uh, that situation. As I say, it wasn't easy, yeah. uh, and Labour hurt uh, as a direct result of it, and we lost a significant mandate. Um, so how were you able to weather that, though, Given, I mean, I remember the march. I remember what you know mm. at Parliament and and all that was happening on Parliament steps and all those visuals of people having a go at you, having a go at your colleagues, you know, Mita and and the like, um, and pointing the gun at you know. And this isn't a very good way of putting it, but pointing everything at you, you know, mm. and saying, "Well, this is on you, not 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 Helen Clark, not this is on you. You're there for us. Mm. 
how did you weather that storm? And also the decision process around staying with Labour, who were yeah. always going to be in the gun in terms of Māori views and Māori perspectives on foreshore and seabed. Yeah, well, I used the political process and the skill set that I had to change the law that was introduced to one that better provided and protected for the interests uh, for for the pe my people and my electorate. Ultimately, we, did, we didn't have a broad enough mandate across uh, the Māori caucus at the time, uh, so I did what I knew to do in terms of ensuring that the legislation that... Uh, was going to go through the House didn't hurt any more the interests within uh, my own law here and hopefully would protect other interests um, uh, for Māori. Um, that said, you know, we had live examples within my electorate where a Māori reservation went out from the Marae into the middle of the Manukau Harbour. Mm. Those interests were protected. We had outstanding uh, claims to our harbours along the west coast uh, and also uh, going up uh, the riverbed, the Waikato River in particular, uh, w which was quite a significant area of interest. Those those interests were protected. Nothing in that act pre prejudicially affected the outstanding uh, river claim that was founded in, in Raupatu. Um, again, that was protected. Uh, so the legislation that was introduced that caused all the harm and hurt um, through participating in the process, again, I was able to negotiate uh, some protections and it didn't impact on the future pathway for the tribe and for tribes within Mairohe to be able to continue uh, their interests. That said, ultimately, uh, Labour lost a, political, a significant political mandate uh, from Māori. Uh, that saw the creation of another party. Uh, and then that party introduced uh, the solution to which, um, whether people liked it or not, became the solution for... But, but for you, you never for lost the support of, of the electorate. You never lost... The support of the people in your rohe. Uh, there's a saying in Māori politics nowadays, which is you could put Iwa up against Nanaia and Nanaia would still win. Throughout that period and even now, uh, the people have always stuck by you. What do you put that down to? Oh, look, I'm not sure if that, that is very accurate. What, <laughs> what I can say is that people who know me know uh, how I operate and I am very in front of people, yeah. my own people in particular. At the end of the day, we have to be accountable to our own whānau. Um, at Wahi, we're a very small marae, very insular in terms of our whānau connections to one another. And uh, it is not without reason for your own whānau to hold you to account and be your uh, toughest critics. Uh, and I just operate like that within the electorate, be in front of people, explain what I'm trying to achieve politically, what the remedies are uh, or could be, and, and try and exhaust myself to find ways to further the interests of my electorate. I've always been like that from the day I got into Parliament, um, right, right up until now. And that approach, I think, um, has meant that people who continue to support me know what they're going to get. And um, I've been in politics long enough to know that uh, you have to maintain a level of personal integrity uh, when you're in a position of responsibility trying to advance things. But you, you've been... And you've said it yourself, you've been, you were resilient, you were brought up in a very political environment, mm. that you learned resilience fairly young, um, that you were like this. Before you went into politics, your approach has been the same. Accountability, transparency, communication, face-to-face -face kanohi, kanohi with whānau. Where does that come from? Oh, that comes from a marae who believes in itself. <laughs> you know, uh, we've got some pretty fundamental ways of doing things at home. Describe fundamental for me, for those who might not understand <laughs> oh, look, the intricacies a, a high level of ahi <laughs> There's a high level of self-belief um, <laughs> uh, in our marae, in our local rugby league club <laughs> about, um, you know, just not being afraid to be the best that we can be and just push uh, towards excellence, whatever that looks like. If it's if you're in the kitchen and you're the cook, you're going to make the best kai, yeah. you know, and all of that. So those homegrown kind of ways translate as you grow older into the way you want to be and, and you know we're uh, success in our in our whanau if there is success everybody succeeds and we just try and um, ensure that we can be the best according to our ability but also according to our aspiration well, let, but Wahi's pretty homegrown uh, yeah. in that um, we're not afraid to step out on things that we believe in even if it is against the flow of the river, <laughs> swim against the river. <laughs> um, I say that kind of knowing 
uh, that, um, you know, some of the people that I've uh, admired when I was young, some of the old people that I admired, and they, when they held the tikanga of our marae, it was kind of others from outside of our particular marae would kind of frown and go, ooh, that's a bit, that's a bit harsh, that's a bit tough. But it, that's just how they rolled at that time. So, you know, we had the ability to see good, strong, homegrown leadership um, for our whanau and for our community. Talk to me about some of those exemplars of homegrown leadership. Talk to me about some of those people who were willing to go against the flow of the river, as you say. It's a oh. great term, I love it. Jeez, well, look, I can't look far past my father in the first instance. Well, let's um, talk about your dad. And then his, his kind of generation. Uh, there's probably only a couple now at our marae who are still alive. Um, but when I think about uh, uh, going back to the time of the Huntley Power Station being built in our community and the promise that that uh, initiative, and that was during the Think Big Days of Muldoon, uh, that that would generate jobs uh, for our community, um, that we would be a community that would flourish, Māori and Pākehā alike, whether you're on the east or the west side yeah. uh, of the river. What in fact happened is that um, most of the labour force was imported in once the station has, had been built and still the backbone of jobs within our community relied on the mines that was there as well. Um, our community uh, rallied around and I think it was the Town and Country Planning Act days uh, tried to fight some of the impacts of that particular development on our community, on our environment, the health of our river. Um, they had the wherewithal, the gumption to believe uh, that their aspirations for the community and our, um, you know, uh, our hapu uh, within our community should have quite a strong right and say in the way in which that development happened. Um, and then there were other things uh, happening at the same time. Uh, obviously, we were um, compiling the claims uh, for Raupatu, the, uh, the harbours, the Waikato River. Uh, and our marae in particular were significant in trying to mobilise uh, the iwi aspiration mm -hmm. around ensuring that those types of issues could be advanced politically, uh, but also with the, the bigger view in mind uh, for our people to sustain themselves. Uh, so, you know, we had a lot of people who um, had self-belief. Um, I believe that there was a level of clarity in the political leadership at, at the time, um, and we had people who, who knew how to work hard, um, whether it was with their hands or with their head, mainly with their hands. Um, and they, they came together and they mobilised and they knew that what, what they were going to put their heads, hands and heart to were going to be for the betterment of our community, our iwi, and that was all under the, uh, the mana of the kingitanga. So, you know, that's the community that, that I'm from. What, what was it like, though, um, as the daughter of a man who was very much at the forefront um, and at the vanguard of, of that movement. Because, uh, you know, for most of us, you know, we have our mums and dads at home. You know, they look after us at home, they're always at home. And here you are, your father was essentially helped lead a movement, right? Yeah. For all people of Waikato Tainu. So what was that like for a young daughter growing up in an environment like that? Yeah, I mean, there's a big shadow that was cast as a result of that. I think Fushu and Seabed became my own kind of political... Um, stepping out from under a shadow and having to make decisions for myself. So, but certainly when I was younger and growing up within my own community and within the tribe, um, there was a big shadow cast by the um, work that my dad did, supported by my mother, uh, supported by the old people that were around him. Um, and he was both a strong uh, presence within our tribal domain as well as the national politic mm. of the day. Um, you know, and to some extent you just weather, um, you know, being the daughter of, and then kind of you walk away and go, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm who I am. But one of the things that my father and mother um, did see in terms of um, our upbringing, my brother and my sisters, that we needed space. We all went to boarding school, and so we got sent away so that we could be our own people um, and find out kind of what we were all about. Um, and also my mother and, and in particular believed that travel was a good teacher. Um, but my sister only got the benefit of that, so she got sent away to school overseas for a few months here and there and to family, friends and stuff. Tra sorry, travel is a good teacher? Because I, I remember, I think, I think it was at your dad's unveiling. Um, 
at Hupu Hupu, where you talked about how you used to do a lot of travel in the backseat of the, of the car with your father, and it would be the longest trip ever because he he would always stop at sites and go, now this is so and so, why got the history? Da, 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 da. And, you know, yeah. you'd be there for a, a one hour trip would take four hours because it was basically a lecture, a, a lecture and a lesson and a, a planning and development for you and, and for the rest of the whanau. Was that really what it was like? Well, actually, it was the driver. <laughs> So I think I learned to drive at 11. But that's what you did on the marae. You could drive, you rode motorbikes and you <laughs> drove. And we used to have a kumara garden. So we used to drive from our marae, probably about eight, uh, five k's or so down mm. the road. And we all learned to drive mm. on that stretch of road or around the marae. So I drove my dad around. So I heard a lot of stories. And he used to take the old people around with him. And we'd never go the same way twice if we were going to a destination. We'd always do a circumference kind of trip towards where we were going. We drove to Wellington a lot. Um, We'd stop in at a lot of people's places, have a cup of tea, um, or he'd just, you know, have that stop that you've got to have. And, um, yeah, and I I learnt a lot. Um, Lots of talking about our history, the kaupapa. The kaupapa was always the kingi tanga and raupatu when I was growing up. But also um, there was visionary leadership amongst our kaumatua, um, people may not have really appreciated uh, at the time, but in retrospect, I really reflect on this, is that our kaumātua, while they may not have had a formal education, they were rich in uh, their spiritual foundation as well as their mātauranga um, and their um, understanding of our um, history, our connections, whakapapa, obviously, and the way in which they could articulate that I, I believe uh, was very humbling to kind of witness because they could simplify things very quickly. But as complex w- as the issues were, yeah. they could simplify things to the core, the knuckle of what we needed to be focusing it on. It seems to me there was planning and development at the core of that, right? It's like not letting the apple fall too far from the tree, um. right? There's learning by osmosis and not just learning history in corridor, but also the way in which you continue that narrative to build professional development for you and the rest of your whanau as you grow up, or, or not? Have I got that completely wrong? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think the best job you could get um, uh, from a mentoring sense is to be the driver. Because <laughs> you get to go everywhere and you get to sit in meetings and you get to listen, observe, and then uh, there beca- there's an aha moment and then you kind of get pushed into a role or something else like that, and you can bring all of that, those things together. You never but thought that was hoha, you know, that's not no, a normal no, kid's no, never. journey. No, no, never. Were you aware that that's different to what lots of other kids were doing at your age at that time? Uh, probably my immediate cousins. <laughs> 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 yeah, probably my immediate cousins because I know what they were doing. Um, but no, nah, in my life, in my farm, no, no, that was how we were. Right. And um, so I'd get woken up at three o'clock in the morning. It wouldn't be abnormal. And then my dad would say, "Come on, we're going to go. We're going to go at the manga." And then if this was before big kaupapa, and then I'd say, "Oh, okay then." And then either it'd be me and him, or there'd be him and a small group of kaumatua. You know, so the taha wairua was as important as what he was t- trying to manifest in the work that he was doing uh, for the tribe. Uh, all around the Raupatu and the claim and trying to find a way forward, really. Um, so, But none of that was abnormal. That was just growing up. That was just normal. Um, and in fact, the more it became normalised in, in our family. We, would, we drove to Wellington lots of times. Um, we would drive to... Congress was around at the time. Uh, we'd go to Tu Whareitoa... Um, Lots um, down to um, meet with Hippie at the time, um, and Dad would, with Teata would talk about kind of what they were wanting to try and achieve for the big aspiration of um, iwi. Uh, and I guess that was a precursor to what we now have, which is the iwi leaders forum. Um, but the, you know, I observed a lot and I saw a lot, and I'm just really privileged that actually that was normalised in my life. Yeah. Yeah. What was that like for you, though, being in, in amongst that... Uh, I'm finding it hard to put the words to it, but you talk about Tahipi, you talk about Terehinui, your father, you know, and others. Tatipane talks about this a lot, that in that environment at that time, 
the the sense of leadership, tahi mihen nari, the sense yeah. of leadership at that time mm. was what was required, which we don't have now. Mm. When you think back on it now, and I know you say you're a privilege, but you, you ever think at the time, wow, this is amazing that I'm just sitting at the feet of these amazing people? Yeah, look, I don't want to overplay it. I was the driver in the cup, <laughs> in the cup of tea maker. <laughs> the cup of tea maker. No, no. I just said, the <laughs> I don't want to even play it. I wasn't like a big significant presence at the time, but I w- it was, um, uh, I think, to have grown up and observed those things and have access to um, leaders who had clarity of thought, had vision and purpose beyond themselves. There, would, there never appeared to me to be a sense of... Um, selfishness about what was being done. It was very much selfless kind of leadership for the betterment of Māori and for, for iwi. Uh, te iwi Māori, actually, that's probably the best way to put it. Um, that's what I observed. But hey, as I say, I don't want to overplay it. I was the driver and the cup of tea maker. Okay. And then you just listened and didn't talk. <laughs> I don't think I earned the right to talk until probably when I was a, in that context uh, about between 17 and 21 and then some just th- naturally some uh, leadership responsibilities around supporting dad more formally became kind of expected um, and then I was going through s- the end of school university obviously and could contribute more uh, to the mahi that he was doing. Who made that decision? Was it, was it your dad said now or how did that come about? Oh God, I'd, I'd like to think, I'd like to think we made it, but I suspect he just pushed, said, you know, you're going to you're going to go out and, and do that. But I mean, again, a lot of things were normalised in my life where I didn't really reflect on those things. The things I reflected on um, in those instances were um, the responsibility of having to, uh, like, put a submission into Parliament on a something, you know, um, or having to stand in front of my own whanau. Well, actually, what was more nerve-wracking was standing in front of your own whanau to try and explain us something, and then you know, they know, you know, what they, they, what you're thinking and all of that. So what, that, was, was, that was more nerve-wracking than standing in front of probably a uh, room full of people. Well, why was it so nerve-wracking? You know, know, the people, people of Huntley are so docile. because, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're pretty, yeah, we... We, um, I think we cherish success and yeah. we want success for our, for our whānau, but we can also be quite critical. Um, and I, I guess it's said with a loving voice, but it might not sound like that sometimes, you know. My aunties, I had some pretty hard aunties, and they would tell you without, with no uncertainty um, what they were thinking about a particular issue and whether or not um, you were doing something that was helping or, or hindering type thing. Yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah, no. The things I reflected on was um, just being puno to the um, to the responsibility that I've been given. Um, trying to make sure I said things with the view in mind that I was this wasn't about me. This was about right. the kaupapa and things like that. And also, um, as a young person growing up, we did have access to a lot of kaumatua, um who shared a lot of things. So you know. When your grandparents or your kaumātua share things with you, that comes with a responsibility yeah. to treat that in a very special way, not to, you know, not to um, diminish. I think any knowledge that you've been given. So it's always mindful of those types of things. Mm. What was that like for your mum? Yeah, well, my mum's from Ngāpuhi, but when she passed, everybody thought she was from Waikato. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Like, long... we knew. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, we knew. Yeah, that's how long she'd lived yeah. uh, in, in Waikato. And I think, you know... Because that's um, interesting in and of itself, you know, given our yeah. less than uh, friendly uh, relationships in the 1800s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's stories behind that too um, about... Uh, I think if there was one edict within Mahi about who you couldn't marry... Everyone else was okay, but you couldn't marry anyone from Napa. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, um, your father again against the flow of the again, river. Against the flow of the river, <laughs> he swam up to <laughs> my mother. Um, but look, um, I think Mum, uh, she had uh, quite a great belief in 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 my father. She, she must have. She married him. She, they were married for such a long time. Um, but um, also in the kingitanga in her role, I, when my dad went up to go and tunnel for her, 
um, there was a st saying that she would be like a, a spider in the House of Kings. Um, and her old people left that with two whanau and when they went to go and tono for her. And um, she always um, was the implementer of the aspiration. So my mum got things done. And she'd always say to her, one of her whakatakias, if you're going to start something, you finish it and you finish it well. You don't just be a starter. Yeah. So my dad would have the vision. And then my mother would kind of be key to making sure that things were being done to achieve that. So she's very pragmatic, um, hard worker, fiercely independent as a, as a Māori woman. So I'm really glad as a daughter to have witnessed um, what it is to be an independent woman um, in a relationship, but also um, in terms of the skill set that you can use to lead. A lot of that, what I have, I'm pretty sure my sister comes from the qualities of our mother. Our headspace might be a little bit of, of our father's side, but very much the way we are um, is, is, has been influenced by our mother. Yeah. Uh, mm. What was that like for her, though? You know, I know you mentioned that um, she was in Waikato for a long time to the point where everyone thought she was from Waikato. Yep. <coughs> Were there ever times where, um, where that got really tough for her? being so far away from, from home, so to speak, or were you going up and back a lot as a child, back up north and learning that side of the whānau and finding yeah. out more about your ngāpohi connection, your ngāti manu connection? Mum was pretty diligent about that when we were young kids. She'd take us up every holidays. Um, look, much to the, um, I, I, I think, um, despair of my whānau back home because we were an ealing uh, community. Eels are our thing, tuna, tuna puhi in particular, but I caught my first eel in Te Marere <laughs> with my grandmother. Um, so, you know, and I always tell that story um, because my grandmother um, taught us how to go and um, uh, pick pippi, um, fish, um, catch eels, um, make kai. She always had a garden. My mother always had a garden. All mm. those things we learned from my mother's side of the family, so very much ahu whenua. Mm. Um, and mum would take us up every holidays to keep us connected um, back to where my mum came from and um, to our whanau up there. My sister keeps a very strong connection up north. I kind of tend to go towards mm. Um But that said, mum's up there amongst her people. Mm. So I think that was her thing, you know, I'm here. But keep coming back. <laughs> yeah, so we were lucky and our whanau up there, they're very um, generous with their, you know, um, sharing yeah. um, our connections and making sure we maintain that ahi yeah. um, amongst us. I'm glad you mentioned the exemplars you had as a, as a young Māori woman because mm. you did have access to some amazing uh, independent uh, fierce, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, but very staunch Māori woman. Your mother obviously is one, your auntie is a wahi pa is another. And of course, another one that had a huge influence on your life was Te Arikinui, mm. Te Atarangi Kahu. Um, what was she like? Uh, well, she could sizzle a hole with one glare <laughs> at you. But actually, what people saw of her, her humility, her empathy, um, her kindness, was very strong. Um, she loved children. She loved the next generation. She loved kapahaka. Uh, she loved to um, culture, all things cultural. Um, she was the reason why I went to the secondary school I went to. She, I stayed with her just about every weekend up until I was about 14. Um, so I saw she loved making scones with lemonade. <laughs> she loved singing. Uh, she, so the, the side of the person that I saw to the side of the responsibilities that she held, you know, they... They just endeared you more to her, yeah. I think. Why, why did you spend so much time with her? Why were you spending weekends with her? Because um, my dad was doing so much elsewhere. And um, my sister was at Queen Vic, and so she didn't come home in the weekends. And I was at a Hamilton boarding school, and I came home in the weekends. So I had weekends. So I don't know. She might have been my babysitter quietly now. <laughs> I, I think because we were quite close anyway, always, from the time that I was born, probably. Um, and I reminded her of one of her daughters, so, you know, it kind of was that kind of relationship. Um, but, uh, again, we'd be always going to hui, pokai, 
Um, that was the time when she did a lot of travelling uh, amongst the Motu and would go to how, um, opening a whare and marae and things like that, so I'd go to a lot of those things. Um, you know, she had wonderful relationships, close loving relationships across the Motu, and people were very warm with her. And, I, and, and again, all of her qualities manifested in how people understood she was as a leader. Very, um, uh, she had a lot of charisma. Um, she was egoless in terms of her vision for uh, Tiwi Māori. She supported big kopa by Kohanga Reo um, Congress, Ngā Puna Waihanga for the arts community. Um, she supported um, uh, the things that would advance our people. And then she started obviously branching out more into the Pacific and travelling and then going internationally. I think she went to Rio for an, um, and she delivered the climate change statement there. You know, so she was really, uh, the time that I can remember in my, in my young teenage years, she was really expanding her leadership to move from an Aotearoa focus and a Pacific focus to more a world kind of indigenous focus. And that's, you know, she was just, that was the strength mm. of her ambition for where she saw Tiwi Māori. It seems to me, and this may be way too early in the interview to kind of come up with this summation already, but it seems to me there was a plan here. Your father, a certain type of leadership. Your mother, a certain type of leadership. Your elders, aunties, uncles, wahipa, a certain type of leadership being displayed there. Tariki Nui, a different kind of leadership. All culminating in one plan, I guess, to give you a trajectory to go forward. Did you ever get a sense that that was at play or is it all just kind of happening around you and you embraced it and then... Mm. Uh, look, um, probably, probably not at the time because the, 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 the master plan was... Tafi, I had the master plan for, um, for our iwi uh, and the tongikura that we all <coughs> now, our, us, our little whanau from Waihu who have grown up, we all carry forward some elements of that master plan. But kind of where our... Like as I was growing up, the manifestation of uh, the uh, the focus of leadership was really te puya. And te puya definitely imp um, impacted on the life pathways of my father in Teata. Absolutely. She was she was the master, you know, if, if there was a game about it, she was the master game <laughs> maker um, uh, in it. And um, so she designed the educational pathway. She almost pre-designed that uh, Te Ata would play quite a strong and significant role in the Pacific, mm. uh, that Dad would have a significant role around the resolution of Raupatu. So, and then our community of Kaumata all still could connect to Te Puya, so it was all very live in that period of time. Um, so I think if there was master planning, um, it was definitely a, a legacy thing, you know, um, and we probably only can glean from looking, you know, being in hindsight mm. rather than in the moment knowing that was the plan. For us as kids growing up though, I want one of the things in our community, again, that was very deliberate was education. Um, it wasn't uncommon for um, uh, my cousins to be sent either to Queen Vic or St Stephen's um, or to, a, or those were the two main Māori boarding schools. So education was really important and then the evolution of our own uh, education model um, which culminated in from a native school to a primary school bilingual and, and now we know it is Te Whirikuru o Rākei Manga. That is our community education model. So I guess if anything, there's a lot of... The, part of that master plan was making sure that we were um, investing the, the core of our aspiration for our community in, uh, through education. Um, the kingi, it's a kura aiwi, so the kingitanga is a strong kind of foundation of that particular kura and that model replicated in a different way for mm. another generation. So yeah, education was important for Tapuya because she knew that um, the next, you know, that her, her people needed to have the skills of both the Pākehā world and uh, the strength of, of uh, Māori Waikato Kingitanga world as well. Yeah. 1996, settlement. After years of, of grievance, uh, Tatibanum again talks a lot about this, about that, you know, unless the people are fighting for something uh, and have something in front of them, once that's achieved, 
the next stage in the fight, it becomes quite difficult. Um, but in 1996, Waikato Tainui achieved settlement, a very significant day, with a lot of opposition again there too at that particular mm. time. Two things then. First of all, how did you think, how did you feel, how did you respond to the criticism, particularly aimed at your father, mm. around that settlement, number one, and then number two, what was the vision afterwards? What was the leadership that was required to win the peace after the leadership that was required to win the war? Yeah, well, I mean, people, uh, I think if I recall, around about 1992 was when the fiscal envelope debate was happening. I was still at university here in Auckland, and there were kind of very vociferous debates about um, that whole approach. Um, and, yeah, there, it, it wasn't a nice time. There was a lot of activism around um, not pursuing settlements, that it would be a sellout for Māori and all of that kind of kōrero. I can remember um, uh, posters being stuck up at Auckland University with my dad and some of the trust board members' faces on it and all these kind of um, things said about them, which I, I I didn't like and I didn't appreciate, so I'd go around the university <laughs> pulling all these posters <laughs> down, thinking, oh, they don't know what they're talking about, they're just... You but know, did it hurt? I mean, yeah, it hurt. It hurt. And um, it, it hurt to the degree where I, it wasn't that um, I thought we were doing something wrong, actually, because all the people that thought they could comment, they went from, from our tribe but believed that they had, had a, could comment. Um, but what hurt was that, um, I guess, the backdrop to some of that was um, unease within the tribe, but also about this pathway. That probably hurt more than the posters. Um, but I remember, I think we were, um, about 92, that, that was that debate. Uh, 94, we had the Heads of Agreement. Mm. So um, there was two-year gestation between Heads of Agreement and Deed of Settlement. And between that period of time, that was probably the time where there was a lot of public education about why are we doing this. The Heads of Agreement kind of led to the gifting back of um, Te Rapa Air Force Base, Hopu Hopu. And then we had two years to try and go around and uh, meet with all uh, the marae communities and educate people about what would the settlement um, be uh, and um, what were the, I guess, inefficiencies of the settlement from our land for land principle base. And, you know, 1.2 million hectares were um, uh, unjustly confiscated from Waikato. We were getting um, a small fraction of that back. Um, and that was a huge hurdle, mental hurdle to overcome with our people. Was this ever going to be enough? So how did they overcome that hurdle? Look, on the day of the signing of the settlement, um, which, again, fraught with all sorts of challenges, I still remember uh, Eva Rickard sitting outside Te Ringa Waiwai Marae with her, um, uh, her banner as we were inside um, uh, completing the uh, the settlement and actually her and my dad got on really well they were so strongly confident in the of their convictions that they were still able to talk to one another even though they disagreed but she sat outside that day and I think um, you know if I reflected on of all the things that my dad believed that he was doing for all the right reasons uh, that that statement that she made it would have been one that, that would have hurt him because I think he did still believe that there was opportunity that would be open uh, to uh, Eva and her people uh, out in Raglan, the people of Poihakina, um, as a result of the settlement. Time has passed and that has been the case. And between both families, we all reflect on that moment. So, you know, time has its way of healing as well. Um, also, some of the greatest... Um, I guess, protagonists of the settlement uh, when it was uh, signed at the time have, over time, been the benefactors or contributed to the way in which a settlement can sustain our people. So, you know, time has played its part and some of that stuff you can't foresee. You've just got to do... Dad was strong enough in his conviction to know that um, the settlement for that time was the right thing to do. And we've seen now, we've got a settlement generation of kids who would have stood up at Te Rangawawa and hickered for that settlement, kind of thinking we're doing this for the kaupapa, but now, 20, 22 odd years later, they are probably the generation that we should ask, has this um, taken 
um, the iwi to a better place and, and I think that would be the true measure of uh, progress um, within our iwi for, with, in terms of the settlement. Mm. You go into Parliament very young, in fact I think you're one of the youngest MPs to go into the Parliament at the time that you mm. went in, 1996. Yeah. You were 20, 20, 25, 25, 26, 26, 26 years old. Yeah. Mm. Why? Actually, I was here at Auckland University and I was doing, just changing from a BA to a, a commerce degree. And I did a postgraduate diploma and some mature Māori women, kind of in their mid, mid-life, um, were just turning to MMP and then they said, we need more young Māori educated women. You tick that box, you're our tutor, because <laughs> I was their tutor. And they said, we think you should do it. And I said, oh, no, no, I'm not going into politics. So they encouraged me. What, why didn't you want to go into politics? Um, I actually didn't see that as a huarahe for me, to be fair. Why not? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It wasn't an active aspiration that I had setting out. Um, Come on, you've been 25 years with your father and telling know, know, all know, this background. I know. And <laughs> I know, but they, they say that if you've succeeded with your children, they're not going to do what you do. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to do something totally different. Um, so I don't know if it was a success or a failure for my parents. But my dad, I can remember when I um, made the decision to stand and um, Teata wasn't happy. Why not? Um, she believed that politics would ruin um, who I was as a person and that it would change me. I can remember that she was with uh, uh, some queer at Hukanui Marae. She rang my father and she said, I want to see you. Uh, and I want you to bring an eye. And she's kind of, their, their relationship, their dynamic was very direct. Um, so if she ever did that, dad would move. Um, they argued a lot. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> in good ways, for all the right reasons. So she rang him, she said, I want you to ca- come and see me, I want you to bring bring an eye. And we went there, and she had her two queer with her, and she sat us down and she said, look, I don't want Nanaya to go into politics, because that will ruin her. And he said, well... I can't tell her what to do. <laughs> she's her own. She's her own person. You can't tell her what to do. Either, you know, if our kids can't think for for themselves, what are we raising? So they had this kind of conversation, and then the queer said um, they listened to both auntie and dad having this conversation, and then she said to me, "Well, um, do you really want to do it?" And I said, "Well, I'll have a go at it. You know, I'll have a go at it, and I'll give it the best shot I can." Actually. The prospect at the time didn't look too good for me. <laughs> really? I, no, because I was standing against six other men, and they all had life experience, mature men, had yeah, fantastic different backgrounds, and I thought, well, you know, I'm a shot in the wind anyway. Yeah. Um, but it so happened that I did, I did get it, and then I haven't looked back since. Um, Teata during. Um, uh, the time of uh, foreshore and seabed uh, gave me some sage advice, which I will take to my grave, around uh, the quality of leadership that you have to maintain in hard times. Good times, people will only see the good things, but in the hard times, they see the quality of your leadership. During foreshore and seabed, um, when I was tested uh, at a personal level and at a leadership level, I took that advice and, as, and I have held on to it all the way through, and that's what's carried me through, even though she didn't want me to be in politics, and I thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. What What was the when you decided I'm doing this, right? Because you yeah. you've got to have a conviction, and I suspect that you and your background and your family are people who of a certain type that once they're in, they're in for the whole. Yeah, world, yeah. Right? Boots what, and all. What Boots What was the What was the defining factor that said I'm doing this, and here's why? Um. I think I probably had made the decision before I put my hand up for the candidacy. And you can imagine 1996, we'd already had the heads of agreement, the deed of settlement had been signed, we needed to steward through the legislation. So I felt that part of my rationale was around the um, the settlement and making sure that that element going through Parliament could be supported and that um, uh, we were, um, there was a challenging prospect of um, us becoming government, but actually, even in opposition, I could play a constructive role. So that was part of the motivation. Part of, the other part of the motivation was to make sure that within our rohe of Tainui Waka, um, that I could contribute constructively to the re- um, supporting the resolution of all claims within our 
Rohe. Um, that said, 22 odd years later, all but Maniapoto mm. uh, have settled and Maniapoto is on its way. Mm. Um, so we are a settled up region who are now able to determine for ourselves, iwi by iwi, and as a confederation, uh, other opportunities that can grow our people, protect our resources, protect our environment, and actually um, apply our manamotuhake principle. And that's all come through uh, the settlement pathway. Because at the time there was a feeling that Labour would become the government. The Pongs were saying that Labour was just shading Jim Bolger at that time, Mike Moore, uh, leader of the party, even on election night, at that fateful speech. Um, and then not long after that, obviously, the leadership changed. But did you have in the back of your mind, oh, I could be in here, well, I could be in government, I could be really close to the seat of power. Was that part of the motivation yeah. or not at all? Well, the irony of all of this is never underestimate Winston. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because Winston that's came true. along and he swooped up all the Māori seats. And so that was really the, the 1996 story, yeah. was the Winston factor. And the fact that he... National would never take the Māori seats in 96, but Winston did. And he created a new impetus around uh, a different way of going into MMP. That said, you know, that, that, that is really what happened in 96. In 1999, a different outcome. Mm. Um, a Helen Clark-led uh, government. Um, but, you know, coming back to your question about did I... Um, at what point did I decide? I think it was prior to seeking the candidacy, knowing that I wanted to support the settlement. And then along my way, I grew up in politics. There are some things in those first years where, you know, the only advice we got from our, our senior politicians were breathe through your nose, look and observe, you know, don't say anything for a period of time because you you really need to uh, be in this place to understand how it operates. Um, so I just became kind of a faithful servant of the electorate, really, and applied my efforts to the little things that, that I could support to be able to break down the barriers, the political barriers that were out there for our people who weren't used to engaging uh, with politics. And also I'd taken over from Koro We who right. had 24 odd years in, in politics. And so people were used to his way of working. And so I had to create another way of working uh, with a um, with the electorate and them with me. For, for many outsiders, like, well, I say outsiders, those who weren't of the electorate and of Waikato Tainui, it seemed like a seamless passing of the torch. That's what it felt like, that you had a passing of the mantle from Koro, been in there a long time, done a lot of good things, passing that mantle on to you. You ever think of that, or did that ever come up? Um... What I can say is I can remember at a tokanga nui anoho paukai and they were all sitting in the little house there and I did go in um, as Koro was having his holding court with Chata and, and, and my father saying, oh, I've got to keep that seat warm, I'm going to have that one day. But that was just being cheeky. I don't <laughs> think I ever really believed that I would be there. Um, but no, there was a break, hey. So there was Koro, yeah, 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 yeah. and then Tuku, yeah, yeah. and then myself. Yeah, right. I think in the tribe's ideal world, um, there would have been a, um, a two-horse kind of complimentary ticket yeah. of both Tuku and myself together. But that just didn't happen um, for a number of reasons. Um, and that would have been seen as a nice um, transition, if you like, to a, a different style of leadership um, and a complementary type of leadership. Um, but we all, we we chose our, our own paths and, yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> what would you have said to someone if they crystal ball gazed and said, you know, in 996, you're still going to be there in 23 uh, years' time? Yeah. You know and what? then the following question from that is, why still be yeah. <laughs> after 23 yeah. years? Um, you know, I thought the lifetime of a politician is a, probably around about 12 years, and actually that is the case. Um, I've always said, and there's been a couple of times where I've tested the mandate, my own mandate, have I been here too long? One was after Bullshun Seabed, I went off the list and I said, look, if you believe I've done a bad job, nothing, I don't hold anything against the electorate, I'm, go, I'm coming off the list and you can you can vote me off, and that's that's your right. And so it should be on big issues like that. So I did that then. Uh, and then um, I got voted back in, and I was um, humbled. Humbled would be the, the the word because what that that message that I received back from being voted back in after Fortune Seabed was, okay, so 
you better work hard to make sure that you uphold the word, your word around these th this way going forward for as long as you're there. And I still, I still take that as quite a strong performance indicator, if you like, or uh, or something that I've got to do and maintain is that kind of vigilance around those issues. The other one was um, I stood off the list uh, uh, in this last election, 2017, because you know there is a growing aspiration amongst Māori around uh, Māori self-determination, especially within the political environment, and having a party that represents that in and of itself is always a contestable space vis-à-vis um, -vis the, uh, the older parties like, uh, like Labour. Um, so, you know, again, my political judgment was, well, we should, um, if we'll put our best up against anybody else's best and the electorate can decide. Um, and so I stood off the list again that time as well in the 2017 elections so that people could match up our policies, um, what we had to offer as individuals um, into the political domain. Um, I don't think it's something that you do too often, but it's something that you should do if you really want to test uh, the appetite of the electorate and give them a good chance to make a really uh, important decision. So, yeah, as so you 20, 23 years in politics has been, in my, in my mind, based on uh, the service that I've given to the, the electorate and you know the, the support and ongoing commitment um, that voters have placed, faith that they've placed in me. And, um, Despite you know, the fact that you've had close relations stand against you, yeah, yeah. close relations organised against you. All spear and love and war. <laughs> <laughs> it's the way it's possible. All spear and love and war. <laughs> so how do you? Because you know you've got to have thick skin, right? I get it. I understand that. But how, how do? You, what are you thinking in your mind when you go, ah, oh, flipping heck? You know, kind of, you've got someone standing against you, you've got people who are your close relations, you know, standing against you and organising against you and all that. How do you not make that a person, how do you not make that feel like it's in a personal affront against yourself and how do you how do you get through that without taking it really, really personally? Yeah, well, I'll use a rugby league analogy. I only played one, two games for Tanifaro Women's Rugby League. Uh, and I remember we played one game at the Narawahi Panthers Club. Uh, and I was playing with my cousins and they were all really good rugby league players. Anyway, they gave me the ball. And I'm, um, you know, obviously in prop position. <laughs> running, running up the field. I was going to say stand off, yeah. but no, keep going. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> running up the field. And these little things come running to me and so I fend them off and they go flying out. And I go, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then I get, and then, anyway, I've, offload it and then you know one of the cousins makes a try and then we get we break off and then my cousin came and he says cuz you're useless <laughs> you don't go and say sorry to them. I said, oh. so it's kind of like that you know when someone stands against you and you know you're going to fend them off and all of that you just say, oh. you know sorry about it but it is what it was kind of thing so politics for me when i have people standing and i don't drop my game uh, I'm going to play the game that I'm going to play, but I do feel, um, you know, that the way I conduct myself um, in an election and in politics is consistent, mm. and people do know what they're going to get if they're going to stand against me, um, and I'm not going to drop my uh, game, um, whether they're a relation or not. Yeah. Because, actually, the issue is that the electorate deserve the very best representative, and I've always said that and in any election. I'm up for a contest, and that uh, you know, over time, the electorate I've represented has been Tutai Hawaru, Tainui, Hauraki, Waikato, and I've always said to voters that you de deserve the very best representation and you deserve the very best race, and I'll give you a race. If 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 if, if other people want to stand, I'll give you a good race. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like that. Um, the lights has gone off when you mentioned um, Tani Farrow. I suspect it was too long a while I'm I am. Anyway, <laughs> um, 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 <laughs> but I'll tell you what, what, what's admirable about um, the way that you, and I'll, I'll go back to 2017, that, that um, contest between yourself and Rahui, what was admirable about that? was that it wasn't a, well, for the most part, you know, this is just my perspective, it wasn't a dirty campaign. You know, it was good man, good woman. Uh, and, and debating the ideas, debating the issues, uh, and, and letting the people make a decision. And, and, and that's what happens. Um, what, what I wonder, though, is going forward, though, um, is that how much longer you're willing to put yourself in that position? 
because 23 years is a long time. And, um, you know, there's always been talk about, for instance, when you work very closely on the Maniapoto um, uh, settlement uh, and you took some time there, you had had a peepee and all these things always come up and people say, oh, that's it, no, no, I'm going to move on now and go, <laughs> go do other things and you, you've remained. And I wonder what else is left on the checklist that you haven't ticked off yeah. that is still keeping you there? Yeah, well, look, I've been given the privilege to be a minister um, in the Ardern government, so um, that's brought with it some new challenges and new opportunities. So the new challenges is for the first time ever we have got an Indigenous Associate Trade and Export Minister uh, who can uh, now create a new narrative in the trade space that does preference Indigenous values. Uh, and creates new opportunities with other Indigenous people. So I think that's something that I can uh, confidently say I can contribute to and do well. Um, in the Māori development space, um, reframing the role of Te Puni Kōkiri uh, with a view in mind of building whānau capability and reorienting towards enterprise is a long-term ambition of making sure we don't become kind of the benefactors of a benevolent society and that we're creating enterprise based on the skills that we have as Māori, Indigenous people. And actually it's something that Te Puya always knew we could do. It's very much a manamotaki principle and taking that into the Māori development space is an exciting challenge for me and bringing those things together. Um, in the environment space, um, people who know my family's history know that we're committed to the well-being of um, our awa, Waikato, and so it allows me the opportunity to continue c to contribute to um, the well-being of water um, mm. as a sustainable resource for us. So I still think I've got things to do and can contribute to. I take my role now more in a mentoring space politically uh, because we've got some fantastic talents uh, coming through Labour and I want to ensure that that talent continues to grow and can feel supported, especially the Māori woman um, in our caucus. Um, and that's something, again, that I believe I can do well. Well, that, that's a very good point, because as you know, uh, and as many people will know, you stood as the deputy on a candidature ticket um, at, a, at a previous election within the Labour Party, um, which many people took to be a very positive step to have a Māori woman as a deputy, potentially a deputy leader of the Labour Party, was an amazing step. Now, Yangati Manu Fanon has taken over that deputy leadership position now. I think I created the pathfinder. <laughs> I might have opened the door for him. Um, but, <laughs> pathfinder's but, that way too. <laughs> but uh, what I haven't heard you say is you still have leadership ambitions within the party. Has that door closed? Look, I've already exercised my leadership ambition and, and am now as a minister. I'm a part of a leadership team uh, who are taking the aspirations of our government forward. I've been the senior Māori vice president of the party. I've contested both the deputy leadership and the leadership. Uh, and the leadership uh, round, that was the round where Andrew Little mm -hmm. uh, actually won and then he uh, passed that over to Jacinda Ardern, of which now I think all of us who contested the leadership are a part of this government. So we're all exercising our leadership roles. And as it should be um, in politics, as we would want it to be in the tribe, you choose the best people, best team uh, to lead uh, your tribe or your party uh, and your country forward. And when you're given that opportunity, you have to still work as a team. So I've been given the opportunity to lead uh, a range of portfolios and I'm just really thankful that I feel for once I'm in the generation of political leadership uh, that is of my time. Because I got in much younger, the political prevailing view was kind of very much in an old mindset. Um, fast forward now to 23 odd years and I'm right in the time of the way of thinking that I can more comfortably contribute to. Which hopefully um, Māori and the country will I see the benefits of. But, you know, politics is a hell of a life, Nanaya. You know, it's time away from Fano. It, it, it's it's um, time away from home. Mm. I've had the privilege of uh, of being at your house along the banks of the majestic Waikato River, as Portaka Maifi always calls it. And um, and I wonder why would you want to go to Wellington every week? You know, 
Uh, why spend so much time away from Tanifaro Rugby League Club, apparently the best rugby league club ever established in the world, according to many people in Huntley? Why keep doing it? You know, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's been said by many people. It's a horrible life, particularly if you've got a whanau. Yeah. Look, I believe I'm making a difference, and I'm, I'm creating a better world for my kids and their mates. Um, we live in Narawahia, so we live in our community. Um, we are reminded every day on a day-to-day -day basis that, that more equity needs to happen within our communities and our society so that uh, our, all our kids uh, can have good access to good education, good health services and all those things, but actually at a community level so every child can reach their true potential. And that's not just the preserve of some, that should be something that all our children have access to and that's fundamentally why I'm doing it. Having kids has actually only strengthened my resolve. Is that right? Yeah. Strengthened my resolve to contribute um, to this way forward. Um, and we make it work. You know, I've had both my children. My son's just turned 10 uh, and my daughter will be turning 7 uh, next month. I have had both my children while I've been in Parliament. So I hope that I've shown other women and Māori women uh, that you can do this and you can do it well and you need whānau support. We're not superwomen, but God, the world needs more superwomen. <laughs> you know, um, and it's possible, it's possible. And so I've got a supportive whānau. Mm. My kids don't miss out, we make it work. I've got a fantastic husband who is long-suffering. <laughs> But he's, he's good for it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, he's the reason why I can do this, as well as the whānau support that I've got around me. So, you know, for as long as I believe that I'm contributing to good things and that, that's, um, and that I remain passionate about it, I'll be doing that. But look, serving people is kind of part of who I am. And um, whether I did that in politics or back within the tribe or in any other sphere, that's kind of how I'm hardwired. That notion of servant leadership, I think we're over an hour, but we'll keep going because, you know, this is good stuff. And um, there's, a, there's a notion of servant leadership that has been threaded through this whole the sky. quarter. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, this notion of servant leadership has been threaded throughout this quarter that you and I have been having, that you've been talking about. <clears throat> it, it seems to me that one and, and and this was exemplified in the exemplars that you've mentioned throughout this corridor. And I wonder whether or not that's a key element we potentially are missing in parts of our Māori community, where we talk about Māori leadership has changed from the generation of your father to the current generation, from the generation of Tereki Nui to the current generation. Is that what's missing? Is that what we require more of? I, I'd just be keen to hear your thoughts on um. how do you think we collectively and what types of leadership we require to take us forward for the next generation? I'm not sure I can answer it, but what I know um, is very evident for this time is that there's a generation who are looking for more values-based leadership and more authenticity and integrity in the leadership traits of people who are, um, I guess, making decisions on their behalf. That's evident in politics. If you take the generation of young people who are concerned about climate change, which is over there, but they've brought it close to them in terms of this is this is our future and this is our, our present. And we want people to be thinking about it, not in a distant way, but in a way that actually everything we're going to start um, doing is with that that view in mind or that, that set of um, values. Um, so I think that's the case in Māridom too. Um, but I can't, I can't comment on, I guess, what's missing. What I can comment on is what um, I sense another generation is seeking. Um, and when we uh, consider the big issues of our time, the level of inequality, the impact of climate change, um, the need for a more humane society, um, integrity in politics rather than kind of fake news politics, you know, these are all common elements of a generational shift and, you know, we're experiencing it here in New Zealand, other countries are now. And I think within, within our iwi um, uh, spaces, that appears to me to be something that, my, um, that the next generation are articulating more and more. 
and, and that's not just Māori either, right? It's indigenous communities as well. Those, those themes are prevalent within indigenous communities. I mean, oh. Tafio, as you know, said kai te awa no oku hoa. Yeah. Right? How important is that collectivism around indigenous communities oh. also? Well, Tafio was the master planner for us. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to get here. I think he's, he, you know, that seven generation principle that the um, Native American peoples uh, apply, I think, is that that time is now. Um, and more and more when I consider the conversations I have with other Indigenous groups, they are connecting to um, kind of more um, environmental, um, uh, kind of humankind uh, types of things, issues. So you can have some quite very complex conversations with a very simplified approach through the Indigenous lens, and I think we have a lot to offer in that space. But, um, you know... Uh, for Māori them, we have to be deliberate about the kind of leadership that we're growing and succession planning continues to be the challenge that we have and we find it difficult within our iwi spaces to be able to transition those who have led to be able to turn, turn the opportunity around to be able to mentor those coming through but create enough space for those new leaders to come through. What happens is that it's hard to move um, to the next space, I guess. Yeah. And we all face that at, at different points. That's why I say I'm at a point in my political uh, career now where I'm using all the skills that I've had uh, to be able to mentor those coming through and actually not have to make the same mistakes, actually um, create, still there's enough ways for, for them to find their, their own path, but I can actually fast track through lived experience this is what this looks like, this is what that looks like, this is what this isn't. Learn from that quickly, because that, otherwise you'll waste your time on it. You know, that's a practical way of um, mentoring, yeah. politically. Hey, um, hey whakarapo to i tātāwa kōrero, hei tupuki aki i tātāwa kōrero. If I was to write your book, the title of that book would, yeah, you don't look very impressed by the idea, I'll put it <laughs> from the way you just responded, but if someone was to write your book, right, and the, and you know, Nanaya Mahuta, or it could be Dame Nanaya Mahuta, but anyway, there's another quarter. Nanaya Mahuta, hyphen, what would the rest of the title be? Politician? Mum? Two game veteran of Tani Whanau? Oh. <laughs> what would the title be? Gosh, I've never really thought about that. I, I asked the hard questions as you oh, know. Oh, I know, that's <laughs> a hard question. Because I probably always thought if there's a book to be written about me, I'll be doing the writing. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it would be hyphen she did. Okay. <laughs> 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 <laughs>